welcome to our Vessel Performance Info webinar, how better speed fuel models can double the benefits of weather routing from our sponsors, Toqua. Our guest speakers today are Kasimir Morobi, founder of Toqua. If you have any questions about our topics today, please type them in the Q&A section and we'll get them answered for you at the end of the presentation. Here is our host, Carl Jeffrey from Digital Ship, to explain more. Okay, our webinar today is about how we can make better speed fuel models for ships where we've got sensor data and how we can use those for better weather routing and all the other decisions related to vessel performance. And we're going to show a case study from tanker operator Euronav showing how it managed to double the fuel savings from weather routing using these better speed fuel models as a basis. And we're talking today in particular about speed fuel models developed with sensor data. So that's an important point. We've, we've had lots of discussions in our other webinars about whether you can model vessel performance using noonday report data or you need sensors. And there's other companies focusing on noonday report data. But today we're focusing on what you can do if you do have sensors, as more and more companies have, and how you can make a better model. Our company presenting today, Tokwa, is a specialist in that. So. I'll explain the basics of a speed fuel model. It's our understanding of how fuel consumption will change if the vessel goes at a different speed or in different weather conditions or has a different loading condition. The weather routing system uses the speed fuel model to calculate the voyage times and fuel consumptions for different route options. So you can make a decision about the route and the better the speed fuel model, the more closely the options presented by the weather routing will reflect reality. And you can also see more clearly what a lot of other things like what investment, what impact the investments in energy savings are having. You can plan maintenance better. You can predict costs and emissions of voyages and use that in discussions with the charterers. So it all comes down to the uh, speed fuel model or power fuel to be uh, technical. Our company presenting Tokwa doesn't do weather routing itself, but it develops the models which other weather routing companies can use. And it makes the models using data science methods, AI, and some real world physics. Our speaker today is Casimir Morobi. He's founder of Tokwa, based in Ghent, Belgium. He did his master's, master's dissertation on machine learning applied to shipping and used his university studies as a basis for starting the business. So I'd like to invite Casimir to start the talk. Thank you, Carl. That was actually a really spot on introduction. Thanks for that. Um, so I'll be sharing my screen. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm Kazimir. I'm the founder of Tokwa. I started the company uh, almost three years ago uh, after writing my master's dissertation on the topic of how uh, machine learning in combination with sensor data could reduce fuel consumption in the shipping industry. I wrote that at one of Belgium's largest shipping companies, uh, CMB. And when I saw the possible climate impact this technology could have, I decided to uh, found Tokwa as a startup with the purpose of bringing uh, the fuel saving uh, potential of this technology to uh, as many ships as possible across the industry as fast as possible. And it's still our goal today um, with Tokwa. So we really aim to accelerate the decarbonization of the shipping industry and very specifically uh, through ship, better ship performance models or speed fuel models, whatever you want to call it, um, that are based on a combination of sensor data and machine learning. Now, maybe before jumping into the presentation itself, I'd like to say I'm very happy to be able to speak here today because when I first started Tokwa in the first year, I spent hours and hours watching webinars of Digital Ship to learn about the industry and the technology out there. And it really motivated us to create the product that we have today. So I'm very glad I can contribute to the webinar myself today. And uh, I very much look forward to receiving your questions at the end of the presentation and then starting a dialogue. Now, um, the case we're presenting here today, as Carl said, is one we have with URNF. First off, we're very proud to have URNF uh, as our reference customer, I mean, they're a big name. They have a really good reputation because they hold a very high standard and it was not easy to convince them. So the fact that we were able to close a deal with them for the whole fleet was very reassuring for us as a company and our technology. Um, now, the case we're presenting today is based on a study they performed on, from their side. Uh, and they concluded that by uh, putting our models, which we call ship kernels, at the heart of their existing routing solution was able to uh, double the fuel saving potential of that, that weather routing solution. So as Carl said, it's important to note that we are not a weather routing solution. We just provide uh, speed fuel models, which we call ship kernels. And uh, we do that, yeah, 
uh, with our own technology. And then uh, because of the higher quality of these models, uh, other solutions such as weather routing can increase their savings potential. Now, this is a pretty massive impact doubling of, of fuel savings of weather routing as it's kind of the go-to use case for many companies out there who want to reduce emissions in the short term. Um, so the fact that we could double that impact is, a, is a really a game changer for many shipping companies who have sensor data today. And so the, the, the fact that we're able to save fuel is directly tied to the quality of the models. So that's the topic I'll be talking about mostly today is these speed fuel models uh, that we develop at Topwa. Now, to develop those, we use a combination of sensor data and a machine learning AI. And now AI has become a massive hype uh, recently. People use the term all the time, even when it doesn't make sense. And that's why we think at Tokwa it makes uh, sense to first take a step back before we dive in. Uh, because actually the first rule of AI is to start without AI. If you can achieve similar results with a simpler, more cost-effective, more explainable approach, you should definitely stick to that. You shouldn't use AI for the sake of it. And so let's respect this first rule and let's look at how is the industry doing uh, shape performance modeling, speed fuel modeling today without any fancy AI. And then <clears throat> uh, in the industry, we're used to seeing graphs like these. Uh, so speed fuel modeling. So on the X axis, you have your speed on the Y, the fuel. And then obviously there's going to be some noise here. Uh, if you use noon report data and in the past, it was blamed on the quality of the noon report data. So it's low quality and it's low frequency. So there's some noise on the speed fuel relationship. Uh, more recently, more and more companies have started to install sensors on their vessels to solve this problem. However, you get a lot more data, but you also get a lot more noise. So just more data by itself does not solve the problem. And that's kind of where we as Tokwa enter the picture, because uh, ship performance modeling is simply very, very challenging uh, for three main reasons. Uh, the first reason is the impact of all your secondary conditions that influence the speed fuel relationship. So you have your waves, your wind, draft, trim, current, salinity, water temperature, water depth, and many more uh, that kind of disturb the speed fuel relationship that you have to account for. Secondly, there's the challenge of having to model non-reference conditions. So most traditional modeling techniques, they start from a C12 curve, and then they might apply some corrections and some tweaking, but at base, they always start from a C12 curve. Now, the problem with a C12 curve is that it's based on certain, it's only valid really for design drafts, design speeds, and good weather conditions. And once you have to start extrapolating to the actual operating conditions of the ship, it quickly becomes uh, inaccurate. Um, so that's a challenge. And then the last one is that the performance of the ship is constantly evolving over time. So uh, a ship performance model is not something static. It should be constantly retraining over time because there's effects like your hull and propeller fouling and your paint degradation, deformations, uh, hull cleanings, retrofits that uh, as a result of that the performance constantly fluctuating over time. And so should your model evolve over time as well. So these are the modeling challenges. But an even bigger challenge we saw when starting the company was the data challenge. It's just getting your hands on good data to start the modeling process from. Um, so in a paper we published uh, last year as part of the HOPIC conference, we um, compared the accuracy of noon report data to sensor data. And we did that for two variables, so for speed through water, so your speed lock. Uh, and there we found an average error of 4%, uh, which is rather okay, because in this case, I mean, in this exercise, we're assuming that the sensor data is the ground truth. And that's an assumption itself, because as many people already know, sensor data can also have their issues. But this is sensor data from a company that closely monitors the quality. And so we, we can uh, rely on it in this case. And so for um, speech water, we found an average error of 4%, which is fine, because as everybody knows, speed locks are not super reliable either. Uh, but then for power, we found an average error of 10%. And that is rather high. That means before doing any modeling whatsoever, if you only have noon report data, you already have a 10% error in your data before starting to model. So that's a 10% error, you can never do better than that if your data is already 10% wrong. And because we want to do highly accurate modeling, we just say, okay, 10% error is too much. And so noon report data is simply not good enough. You need sensor data if you want to do highly accurate modeling. Um, then this is an overview of all the modeling techniques out there in the industry. Um, so there's the traditional formulas, then there's the C12 curves, and then there's what we call the standard approach, which is a combination that we see used by most shipping companies and most software systems out there today, which is you start from the CGV curve, you apply some corrections for secondary conditions based on, for example, ISO standards, and then you might do some tweaking using new reports. Um, this is really what the majority of systems are using today. And then there's a full black box, full black box approach, so a domain agnostic machine learning approach where you just you, you take a lot of data, you put it in a model, and something comes out, but you really don't know what or why. You don't, you're not really in control of it. And sometimes there's weird outlier predictions that you can't explain or control. So that's dangerous, and that's not what we do. At Tokwa, we focus on physics-informed machine learning, which is a sort of hybrid approach that tries to combine best of both worlds. 
Um, so it's still data driven, it's still machine learning, but in the learning architecture of the model, you embed physical rules and naval architecture principles. So the output of your model always respects a certain physical reality. And the models we create using that we call ship kernels, and that's basically the name of our product. Now, the question then uh, becomes, okay, how do these ship kernels compare to other modeling techniques? And how does having sensor data improve the modeling accuracy? And that's also uh, the conclusion of a paper we wrote uh, last year, where we compare four different modeling approaches uh, using the same inaccuracy metric. So maybe to give some context on what we're visualizing here. So let's say we take a few months of completely unseen data of a ship uh, operational, operationally, and every five minutes, we say, okay, this is the speed, this is the draft, these are the, the weather conditions. What does the model predict the fuel consumption will be for those conditions? And then you compare the predicted fuel consumption against the actually measured fuel consumption on board the vessel at a frequency of five minutes. And we do that for all four uh, modeling methods. And then we express the error as a percentage. So that's the mean absolute percentage error on the y-axis is the percentage difference between the prediction of the model and the actual value measured on board the ship at a five minute frequency. So that's why the errors are rather large here is because you do every five minutes. So there's quite some volatility. If you would do it every day, every week, every month, the errors would be much lower. Uh, anyway, uh, the most simple approach we're using here is the CTRA curve, which is a huge oversimplification. Uh, you're just using yeah, the CTRA curve to predict for all conditions. You're not even trying to correct for wind and waves. So obviously that leads to a, a large inaccuracy as it's an oversimplification. And in this case, it leads to an inaccuracy of 22%. If we then apply corrections for wind and waves, for example, as recommended in some ISO standards, then um, the error drops by around 8% to a 14% uh, error, which is, I mean, a lot better, but it's still not great. If we then look at data-driven techniques, uh, and for example, first we apply a very simple machine learning approach to only noon report data, which is the blue line, we see it stabilizes at around 16% inaccuracy. And that's interesting because that means that if you only have new report data, it doesn't really make sense to look into complex modeling techniques like AI because a simpler and more cost-effective approach like your CTRA curve plus corrections performs better. On the other hand, if you do have sensor data, which is the orange line, and you apply a complex modeling technique like our ship kernels, uh, then you can see the accuracy can be double as good as the best alternative, and that's a very big improvement. Um, now, this is a very clear uh, step forward if you do have sensor data, but we recognize that, yeah, for the majority of fleets today, sensor data is only equipped on a part of the fleet, and there are still many vessels that only have new reports or only have been collecting sensor data for a very really limited amount of time. So to solve for this question and to make sure that there's a modeling approach that captures the potential of sensor data, but that's you're able to use for the whole fleet, we came up with the augmented approach. And that's the purple line on this graph. Now, maybe a quick word of context on what the augmented approach is. Uh, let's say we have two similar ships, uh, not per se sister vessels, but let's say two VLCCs. And VLCC A has sensor data and VLCC B, VLCC B only has a new report data. We can train a model on the sensor data of VLCC A to learn what's the impact of the draft, the speed, the weather conditions. And then we can transfer those learnings on a meta level to ship B. And I use the ship specific new report data of ship B to tweak those learnings of the other model to that particular vessel. So that way we have still a ship specific model, but with the experience and the prior knowledge of the other ships with sensor data. As you can see, um, so here the orange line is what if you would have ship specific sensor data. The purple line is what if you would uh, only have noon report data, but you apply those prior learnings via the augmented approach, as I said. And then the blue line here is what if you would only use a noon report data. So as you can see, uh, using that augmented approach leads to a big uh, improvement in, uh, in modeling accuracy. And that's very important to us because uh, we really want to have that climate impact. And to do so, we need to increase the usability of our models. And so with this augmented approach, you can have one modeling approach that works for your whole fleet and definitely benefits the ships with sensor data. But even the ships without sensor data get a big improvement uh, by capturing kind of the potential of the other ships that do have sensor data. So I've been talking a lot about, you know, modeling and accuracy. Uh, I'm sure your question is, OK, but why does it matter? What is the impact of this? And the core is that basically every decision in shipping starts from the speed fuel model, as in, in how fast should we sail? Uh, is there any underperformance? Should we do a maintenance event? What route should we sail under the current uh, weather conditions? Um, how should I commercially describe the performance of my vessel in this contract? How do I simulate the CII for the rest of the year? Um, all these decisions start from the speed fuel model. And the fact that today there's a 10 to 20% error with traditional techniques on the speed fuel model means that every single decision, every single optimization in shipping is at least 10 to 20% inaccurate. 
And our goal at Tokwa is to reduce that 10-20% inaccuracy to just a few percentages so that every single decision, every single optimization shipping becomes more sharper and becomes more optimal. And there's many examples of this, but a very visual example we like to start off with is actually whole performance monitoring. So these are examples of solutions we see in the industry today. So this is not our solution of how whole performance monitoring is done. And then you have the typical problem that if you, for example, here, watch your speed loss over time using new report data, there's quite some noise. So there's like a 10, 15, 20% noise here. And it's very hard to identify any trends or insights or this, this doesn't really support decision-making, let's say it's just noisy. Uh, on the right with sensor data, it becomes even worse. So here they show excess power that ranges from minus 10 to plus 30 percent so again a 40 percent range of uncertainty and again really there's no story here it's, it doesn't support you in your decision making and this is a very practical example of where our models can make a difference because our models they learn for the effect of the the wind the waves the draft the speed of all these factors that cause the noise and they normalize for them so they compensate for them so you can paint a clear picture where you can only see the remaining impact of the fouling by itself and that's the the following graph so here on the y-axis, you can see the speed loss. You can also show excess power or excess fuel, but in this case, we, show, we chose speed loss, uh, which is indicated by the red line. Then the green periods are uh, idling periods, so when the ship is at anchor or in port and when fouling would grow. And then the blue lines are uh, events, so propeller cleanings or hull and propeller cleanings. In this case, we can see the, the performance of the vessel was pretty stable in the beginning until the first longer idling period here of about four weeks. Uh, fouling grew and performance dropped to a 5% speed loss. Um, they sailed like that for around two months and then they did their first hull and propeller cleaning, which restored 2.7 out of the 5% speed loss. So this cleaning restored some efficiency, but not everything, only part of it. Uh, yeah, it goes down a bit due to fouling. Then there's some missing data here. That's why it's diagonal. But hidden here in this island period is a second hull and propeller cleaning, which only restored 0.2, 0.3% uh efficiency so it's a very ineffective cleaning and that's the thing we see not all cleanings are as effective there's a big difference in between cleaning companies and techniques used and that's also interesting in, those are also interesting insights to to know uh, then a stable period another cleaning uh and then finally a very long island period here of around uh six weeks i think uh performance drops all the way to an eight percent speed loss due to fouling which is really significant uh, if you convert the speed loss to you know power or fuel, it could be 20, 30% excess fuel, depending on what um, speed your vessel sails at. And then finally, after three, four months, they they only then they react and they do their uh, final hull and propeller cleaning, which restores six and a half out of the 8% speed loss. So really effective cleaning, save them a lot of money and emissions. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have much data afterwards to see was it actually uh, a good cleaning or not. Uh, because uh, they sold the vessel, but it would be interesting to see, okay, was the cleaning maybe too aggressive? Did they remove a lot of the paint? And the performance quickly start deteriorating uh, afterwards. But this is just one very visual example we like to start off with to show, okay, was the impact of having, having better models at the heart of, of these visualizations? And you can see this paints a much clearer picture that supports you in your decision-making and also allows you to learn from your past decisions to build a more long-term strategy on maintenance planning. But in general, our goal at Tokwa is just to raise the bar for ship performance modeling uh, in general across the whole industry for all applications. And up until now, I've mostly spoken about the relation between your speed to water and your power, because that's the most challenging one to model. There you have the effect of your draft, your weather conditions, your fouling. Um, but from a practical point of view, you'd also like to know your RPM, your fuel consumption, your speed of the ground, maybe even your emissions. So our model is allowed to jump in all directions between all these variables with a very high accuracy. Um, Secondly, they allow to do so for all imaginable conditions. So you are no longer restricted to design draft, design speed, or good weather. You can say exactly at this speed, exactly at this draft, at this wave height, from this angle, what's going to be my performance. So much more flexibility. And third is that the models evolve with a ship's performance over time. So they're not static, uh, made once and then left like that. No, they're constantly being retrained on the latest data coming in. So the model always reflects your latest performance and how is my ship performing today because actually that's actually the performance you want to, to know for your decision making and uh, a way of visualizing those three things is like this so on the left top we see um, red is raw sensor data and then blue is after our model has learned and compensated for all the secondary conditions so we can paint a much clearer picture of what's my actual performance like undisturbed by all these secondary factors um, second, you can see there's much more flexibility in the modeling as well. So you can change the wave height to exactly this, change the wave angle, change the draft, change all the secondary conditions, and then get an exact speed power, speed fuel curve for that, that particular vessel in those conditions. So there's much more flexibility there than traditional models. And we'll come back to that later because that opens a lot of possibilities for other applications to build on top of this. 
And then lastly, uh, the molds are always updating and retraining. So the blue line here is the sort of baseline. It's uh, how was my ship performing after dry docking uh, at its most efficient. And then the green line is actually um, how is my ship performing today? In this case, let's say three, four years down the line with some hull fouling, with some paint degradation. And so retrain on the latest data. Uh, the green line is your current performance and that model is constantly retraining to make sure that the model you're using always reflects today's performance. Um, another way of visualizing that is like this. So on the left, you basically have all the uh, performance influencing factors. You can change those to exactly what you're looking for and then get an answer. Okay, at this speed, what's going to be my RPM, my power, my fuel consumption in those exact conditions? Um, so this is, a, this is a nice piece of technology and it's definitely an improvement upon the traditional approaches to, to ship performance modeling. But at Topa, we recognize that this is only just a piece of technology. Just by itself, it will not save any fuel. Um, and that's why our philosophy is actually that the real value is not the models, it's how you use these models. And that's where the expertise of people inside shipping companies and of existing maritime software companies uh, lies. Uh, we at Toko, we just want to focus on the models because we see today in shipping companies uh, that have sensor data, a lot of time is spent slash lost on you know collecting the data, cleaning the data, creating the models, updating the models, correcting uh, for the models. And only a fraction of their time is then actually left to use these models to you know, take fuel saving decisions. And we kind of want to turn that around where we as Tokwa, we focus on the models. So whatever data you have, we, we try to create the most, the most accurate models possible. And then we make those available to the experts inside the shipping companies in a very flexible and modular approach. So you, the expert can use these models to take the decisions because in the end, you know best uh, your fleet, your operations, the routes you sail and where you can give and take in your operations to, to optimize for. That's not our expertise. We as Tokwa, we just want to focus on the modeling because that's what we're good at. And so this, this strategic focus on modeling also has a big impact on the format of our solution. Um, so we are not another dashboard. We are not another all-in-one solution. Um, what we want to do basically is we want to take whatever data sources you have, so weather data, sensor data, noon reports, cleaning events, and create the best possible speed fuel models, uh, make those available via an API to plug into the back end of the existing solutions already you already have, because we recognize yeah, all the companies out there today, they already have uh, dashboards, routing solutions, what have you. So we're not trying to compete with those. We just want to put the best possible speed fuel model in the back end of your existing solutions because we see having those models much more, much more sharper drastically increases the quality of the output of those existing solutions because every number they show, every visualization they make, every optimization they recommend, it's all based on the speed fuel model. So if you drastically improve that, you drastically improve all the numbers and outputs of those existing solutions. So we started already talking about the routing one where we saw with URNF, if you improve the quality of your speed fuel model at the heart of those algorithms, you could potentially double the fuel savings of your weather routing, which is a massive impact. But the same, for example, goes for commercial decision-making. Uh, you might, for example, have a voyage management system where, uh, I mean, there simulations on profitability, they're also based on the speed fuel models. So the sharper you get that, the, car the sharper your commercial simulations and the sharper those decisions will be. And that goes for basically all software systems out there. So I mean, it goes for performance solutions, it goes for uh, CII simulating solutions, basically everything. And then finally, we see a lot of larger companies also prefer to develop um, solutions in-house. So they might develop their, their own software platform. Uh, and they're actually very interesting for us because our API, because it's so modular, you can just use our, mo our models as a building block within your existing solution that you are building uh, in-house. And that's, for example, also a thing that Uranav does. They use our models when they're routing, but they also prefer to build a large part of a solution for performance themselves, and they can plug our models as a building block within that solution. Just for legal reasons, are those companies your clients, or are they just examples of the companies you could work with? Uh, that's a good question uh, <laughs> for legal reasons. Uh, so up here, these are all uh, companies we could work with. We're not ah, yeah. working okay. with all of them. We're working with some of them, but not all of them. It's just to give the people an idea of like, what's the vision for the company and who are the companies we can work with. But given the fact that our product is API first, it's, yeah, we can technologically work with all of them and it's really a strategy of our company, but then it will depend a bit on the companies, but we put companies up here of which we know that, uh, you know, they are rather open to work with, but we have no official partnerships yet. All right, we, not with all of them, let's say, but with, with like half of them. Okay, fine. If that answers your question uh, legally and the lawyers. Yeah. <laughs> no, thanks for asking, Carl. Um, so then the question is, how can this save fuel? Um... Well, uh, we already discussed some examples. The main example we want to discuss today was the URNF case where we saw that plugging these models into um, their existing routing solution could 
double the savings potential of routing. And, and then when you look at it, that, that's kind of intuitive because a routing solution tries to find the optimal route given the weather conditions. So at the heart of that lies trying to understand, okay, what if I take a route that's a bit different where the waves are slightly higher from a slightly different angle with slightly different currents? How does that affect my fuel performance? So before your routing optimization can be really good, you need a model at the heart of that, a really good cost function that's very granular and sensitive to all these small changes in secondary conditions. And that's exactly what our models provide. So if you look at it from that perspective, it makes a lot of sense that the sharper you get the model, the sharper the optimization on top of it becomes. And if you're interested in more technical uh, you know, questions, uh, technical background on the study, uh, we also published a white paper with a proposed methodology on how you can assess the fuel savings of weather routing and how you can assess the added value of having a better model at the heart of that routing solution. But again, uh, as Carl also said in the beginning, this is only one example uh, of additional fuel savings to better models. There's many more uh, examples. So apart from the weather routing, there's also the whole performance monitoring, which I showed visually. So the sharper your model is, the sooner you can detect any performance and the better you can react. And the better you can also build a sort of long-term strategy to learn, okay, which paints work well, which cleaning companies work well, which idling periods have a bad effect. And so you can kind of balance the long and short term to really get to a good long-term strategy. Uh, third is also very interesting. We see a lot of companies uh, are trying to reach their short-term decarbonization targets by installing, you know, ESDs like uh, rotor sails, air lubrication, new types of paint. And all these solutions, they claim like one, two, four, six, eight percent in fuel savings uh, theoretically. But then once you actually install these devices uh, operationally, it's very hard to measure how much is it really saving me for my vessel because the traditional monitor monitoring methods are like ten to twenty percent inaccurate, so you can't identify it. A three to four percent improvement, let's say, within a ten percent inaccuracy, and that's something our models are able to do because they're highly accurate. You can actually see the jump in performance due to the ESD, and based on that, you can decide: okay, is it worth to install this on the rest of my fleet? Yes or no. Uh, fourth is the more commercial application. So every commercial simulation or CII simulation towards the future is also based on a speed fuel model. The sharper you get that, the sharper you can take all the decisions uh, on top of that. And lastly is really a vision we have as Tokwa for the future, where today we see there's very limited data sharing and active collaboration between owners, charterers, and ship managers. Um, because of the way basically that commercial contracts are set up in a zero sum game, there's not a lot of incentive for them to work together. There's basically conflicts of interest why they can't be fully transparent with one another. But towards the future, we see the need for them to, to get closer to each other, to work more actively together, to fight for every percentage of fuel savings. And it's a trend you already see ongoing now. And we believe technology like ours that's independent of a certain front end software uh, can provide a technological answer to that question. So you can all use the same ship performance model and then plug it plug it into the software that you prefer to use. So even if the owner and the charter use a completely different software system, they can still start from the same numbers, which makes it much easier for them to, to work together and to take decisions together. So that's more of a vision we have for, uh, for the future. Uh, so yeah, that was basically the presentation. Uh, maybe I'd like to, to recap uh, what my, my point was I wanted to get across. So if you have sensor data today, or even if it's only a part of your fleet, and you're not, let, not yet using a technology like this, then you're basically leaving a lot of money on the table. And even worse, uh, you're creating a lot of emissions that could have been avoided in the first place. And that's really important. Uh, it should be a priority for everyone these days. So if you do have sensor data, even only a part of your fleet, definitely uh, send us a message and we'd be happy to you know discuss your situation and uh, see what's possible. So yeah, that was it. Thank you very much. Uh, back to you, Coral. Well, that's fantastic. Well, we'll go to the Q and A part. I can see three questions already, of which I'd, maybe you can only answer two of that, two of those. But um, yeah, um, I think I think it's amazing. I think um, well, yeah, the better modeling means all this stuff we want to do with shipping can all get done a lot better. I think that's a, that's a great point and uh, something the whole industry, well, some people, probably everyone on this webinar understands this, but uh, other people think that ship performance modeling is all about technologies and fuels and stuff. But uh, better models is a uh, the way to go as far as I can see. So um I guess we'll go straight to the question. So Juris or Juris Sillins is uh mm -hmm. with uh energy conservation specialist with Stolt Tankers. He's asking about the uh propeller thrust data analysis. I don't know if you're differentiating the propeller thrust with the power of the whole vessel. I don't know what the difference is, or you can sort of work out what's to do yeah. with the propeller cleaning or I'm just trying to reread the question to understand. Um, no, the short answer to that is no, uh, we do not. We do model the RPM. 
uh, but we don't do like uh, optimization of RPM, uh, like propeller settings and stuff like that. That's not our focus. Uh, but I also see a good question from uh, Peter, if it's fine if I take that one, Carl. Well, that was one I thought you wouldn't be able to answer. <laughs> oh, no, it's, it's my pleasure to answer that one, actually, because right. uh, Peter is from Thayer, and they're actually the routing company that Uranav uses and that we're very glad to work together with. So basically, uh, they found that using our speed fuel models within the routing solution by Thayer was able to double the fuel savings at Uranav. <laughs> so we actually collaborate, so very happy to name drop them. <laughs> so Peter could have mentioned that himself. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, I guess. Very good. So Nirmal Harude Chalam Chala, who is with a shipping data analyst supervisor at Uton in London. So he's asking how you optimizing the models. Because I think it's amazing. Well, it's a very important point that these these things are dynamic. They've got to be changed the whole time. It's not like here's a data, isn't it? Um yeah. I, I guess you do it all the time. That's the answer, is it? Or, yeah. Um yeah, so uh, how are these models optimized with changes in operational parameters? Um, so I don't know if, if uh, Nirmal means here, like how do we compensate for wind, waves, draft, etc. Because I'll just answer that first, that, that we learn from the data of the ships together with the physics-informed machine learning. So it's a kind of hybrid approach we take. And the more data we see of the more different conditions, the better the model can you know, compensate for those conditions. If your question is how do we update performance over time, because as the whole performance change, for example, the model should change over time. Again, same answer. We base that on the actual operational data that comes in. We retrain the model on the latest X days or weeks of data coming in, and we optimize the model to reflect those performance changes. So the answer is always it's based on the data, but because we use physics and for machine learning, is always there's like the sanity check of the physics around that. And you're optimizing continuously. It's not just a... Something you exactly. do and then you can, it's, yeah. it's an ongoing process. It's not like one time you create a model, it's constantly retraining, optimizing, and, and getting better over time. Okay. So if we go to Michael Schmidt, I think he's head of ESG at Copenhagen Commercial Platform. He's asking about after a prolonged port stay, how long a data period you need to say something meaningful. I suppose that means if there's sort of fouling building up on the on the ship in port. Um so yeah. well, I guess you do you want, so the graphs you had, I suppose you have to revise revise your model, but uh, you're not exactly. starting from scratch, is it? Good? So, so we actually came up with a pretty creative solution for this because, um, for example, if you're currently idling in a port for, let's say, a month, and then you're going to plan your next uh, voyage uh, with the routing solution, for example, you know, I mean, the, the, the expert, the performance analyst knows there's going to be a performance decrease. But there's no way that the routing solution would already know how what the impact would be because there's no operational data yet of what the effect of that is. So there we offered the performance analyst or anyone in the company to, for example, add a, a factor to it. So I expect this idling period of, let's say, a month to have a 10% decrease in performance. And then we can already add that to the model so it's accounted for. Uh, so that's a way we counter for the fact that our models are not able to say the impact of the, the performance change the day it leaves the port. Uh, but then to answer Mika, Mika Mikhail's question uh, is to it, we need around like two or three weeks of data to be really stable in the in the, the change we we detect. But we can do it shorter. But it's basically the more data you have, the shorter you are. So at, let's say after two three weeks, we're very sure of the the change we see due to the idling event. Okay. So next two questions, are both on sensors. So Mahesh is technical manager at I I N O Lines in Singapore. Mohan is lead vessel performance with a smart ship hub. Both asking about um, what sensors we're talking about. Yeah, um, good question. It's really, it's, you don't need that many sensors, but you do need good sensors. So it's mostly we need uh, data on the speed. We need data on the main engine power. So those are torque measurements. And then also on the fuel. So that's fuel flow measurements. So these three are important to get good. But as we've seen, it's not easy to get high quality measurements on these. So, um, but these are the three essential ones. And then all the other variables are pretty straightforward, like your RPM, your heading, your location. These are always collected by default and then the weather you can get from, you know, weather data providers. But these three are the ones you should get right. And we see, I mean, speed is obviously logged by all ships already today, high frequency. And it's then usually the main engine power and the fuel consumption. They are not always available on all ships yet today, but we see it's drastically increasing in the fleet and more and more people are installing it because they recognize they need good data on these variables before they can optimize for it. Yeah, I mean, your talk was a bit of a sales pitch for sensors, I think. That's... <laughs> Actually, it is, and we don't even sell sensors, so there's no, uh, no conflict of interest here. I, I would really recommend everyone out there if they to make a budget for it because it's not that much money and it has a major impact of your understanding of vessel performance and how you can optimize for it. So it should be a no-brainer, but we're actually surprised how few companies only have sensor data today. Oh, so uh, now we're going to Jolie, who's a 
Spart ship manager with Bureau Veritas Marine and Offshore. He's asking about the accuracy of the weather data. And uh, is, that, is that something you looked at or are you assuming? Uh, yeah, it's, it's an eternal question, right? Because there's no straight answer to it because who knows what the the real wave height was in the middle of the Pacific at that timestamp. I mean, nobody, it's very hard to have the, the ground truth on that. Um, so the only thing we can do is experiment with different weather providers and then see which weather providers yield to the most accurate models. Uh, but yeah, there's no straight answer to to who is best and, and what the accuracy is because it's very hard to even know the ground truth of what the actual weather was at a certain location at a certain time. Uh, but it definitely has a big impact and it's something beyond our control. So that's something I can say. And it's definitely worth uh, the money and the effort to have a good weather provider for sure. Okay, so now we've got a long question, but it, Marzi is Director of Manager EU Research Relations um, with, uh, in, uh, in Hamburg. Uh, so he's asking about, um, oh, hang on, he's not with the EU, he's Hamburgische Schiffbau, so it's a shipbuilding association, I think, but uh, well, he wants to pick apart your slide 14 about the, the cleaning. Why is the performance better after the first idle time? So there's no propeller feeling in between. I mean, you don't know this isn't, I mean, you don't know why it's better or worse. You're, you're analyzing it. Do you just take the first question at once? <laughs> first, <laughs> I don't know. Uh... Yeah, I'm, I'm reading the question. It's quite a long one, but I, I think I can answer both parts of that. Okay. Uh, um, so the first part of your question, uh, it is true that uh, if, if you would go back to that slide, that in the beginning, the performance- well, You can put the actually... slides up if you want to. Or, or well, not. no, it's fine. No, it's... Okay, it actually yeah. deteriorates a little bit. Uh, but it's really, it's yeah, it's only like 0.2, 0.3%. And I, I, never, I mean, our models are obviously not 100% accurate. On like on a voyage level, they're around 99% accurate. So there's still a 1% kind of like uncertainty or like where you can go up and down. Um, so that's the 0.2% falls well within that 1% range. So you shouldn't see the lines there as an exact number. It's more like there's a little bit of uncertainty on it. So that's why it could go slightly up. But I mean, the trends you saw, they make a lot of sense and they are actually really accurate. And then the second part of your question, um, how is the physics informed in a machine learning model? I guess is your computational question? fuel dynamics. So you can uh, you could have a physics of the, the ship. But you're using AI. You're not using. Well, you're using a uh, bit no, of physics. I, I, yeah. I think I get it. I think I yeah. get it. Uh, well, it's a double question. Is first, how do we yeah. include Good the physics? Question. So that's physics informed machine learning. Uh, there's a lot of papers on that. I can link link that to you if you want to know how you embed these physics into a data driven model. And then how do we um, assess? Uh, the target performance? And that's a really good question. Um, so as I said, what we do is we look at unseen data of the vessel. So we take, for example, X months of data where the ship um, actually sailed in, but that data has not been used by the model to train. Then we ask the model to predict at this speed for this draft for these weather conditions, what do you expect the fuel consumption to be? Um, and then we compare that predicted consumption against the actually measured consumption. And then the the difference between the two is the accuracy of your model. So that's how we compare against the actual target variable. So unseen operational data from measured on board the vessel. And then that's using the AI and the physics models in parallel because it's totally exactly. different so methods. But yeah. Our model is actually a combination of the two. And then they create predictions and we compare those predictions against the actual unseen data uh, that happened on board the vessel. Okay, even, even with the physics one as well, I suppose you do. Yeah, you compare. So yeah, well, the physics model works. I know that's how you train AI data, but... Uh... Well, we actually yeah. have some papers we published, uh, if you want to go really in, in depth on our site, where we compare more traditional methods based on only physics against our kind of more hybrid methods uh, in the same way. And we, we put them side by side. Uh, so feel free to check that out on our, on our site. Okay. So Jose is a data scientist with GTT Group. They also do a lot of vessel performance, but he's asking why we were talking about fuel speed relationship instead of shaft power speed or fuel shaft power i think we well, just sort of simpler to talk about fuel speed than but to me but uh, it doesn't make a lot of difference does it or... it's it's a good question actually um because there is a difference um the reason we, we split it up into the separate parts is because it allows you to identify issues in the separate parts for example if there's an underperformance between speed and power that's going to be probably due to your hull performance. While if there's another performance in a relationship from power to fuel, that's going to be your engine performance. And so by splitting up into sub-relationships, you can identify if the underperformance to what part of the ship it, it can be attributed to. Um, so that's the reason we decide to, to split that up. Wow, we're getting a lot of very high-level people asking. This is Marco Pedroni is uh, with, with Rena. So the ship model is trained on high-frequency data. So if you want to make a fuel consume prediction for a future voyage, 
When you only have a general weather forecast data, are you going to lose the accuracy? Or oh, I don't know what HFD is. Oh, high frequency know. data. High yeah, frequency yeah. data. Um, Mark, Mark, Mark so the model is made with a high frequency data and you can use that to make the forecast, isn't it? Or yeah, so it's a very good question, very valid right. question. Uh, also, I touched upon it before. We are not in control of the quality of the weather data. And as everybody knows, weather forecasts are only that accurate. And especially the further you go into the future, the less accurate they become. So it's true that when I say we have a, an accuracy of 99% on a voyage level, that's on a historical voyage where we know what the weather data actually was. When you talk about a future voyage, you don't know what the actual voyage, uh, the weather data will be. So the, the accuracy you will have to predict the future voyage will depend on how accurate uh, the weather predictions are for that voyage. But if we assume that data to be 100% correct, our accuracy would be around 99% on a voyage level. Unfortunately, that's not the case, but that's something beyond our control. So we can only do as good as we can, given the weather predictions we have. Oh. So very valid question. And then also different effect, obviously on, on the validation, say the savings validation of routing. And again, I would refer to the paper we have on our site where we go a bit more in depth on all these assumptions and how we try to, to be as uh, scientific as and objective as possible. Yeah, the weather forecast is not a limitation. I think the weather forecast is pretty good these days, or is that the maybe the weakest part of the whole picture? Is it the weather forecasting? Or? It depends a bit. I mean, weather forecasts are definitely not ninety nine percent accurate. That's for sure. So that will they will definitely yeah. need additional accuracy the further you predict in the future, for sure. Okay, so Shakil Ahmed is director of operations with this this well group of companies, which is a sort of certification company. If you've got a how to get over log speed sensor data, which is 40. If it's yeah. 40, most of the time on board, we have to consider log, uh, log speed. Does it mean log book speed? I think it means, is it? Uh, yeah, no, it's a very good question. It's spot on. Uh, I mean, okay. basically, when, when choosing what speed you're going to model from, you can choose between the speed of ground and the speed through water. The speed through water is measured using a speed lock, and it's a type of sensor which often has sensors and offsets and calibration errors. And that's the thing we see as well. We're actually going to publish a paper on that um, at the upcoming HELPIC conference this year on, yeah, if you should start from um, speed to water or speed of the ground, what the possible issues are. And I don't want to spoil the conclusion of the paper yet because we still have to publish it officially. But basically, it's much more reliable if you start from speed of the ground. Um, it's much more robust over like a whole fleet of vessels. Uh, if, even though speed to water might have some additional accuracy if it's correctly calibrated. But it's a big risk to trust on the sensor blindly because often it does have issues. So the more robust and safe approach would just be to start from speed of the ground and then apply corrections for currents yourself, even though current predictions are not 100% accurate either. We saw over our study and uh, the amount of vessels that we did the study for that it's, it's a much safer approach to start from speed of the ground plus corrections. Wow. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, as as the model gets better, we find all these weaknesses and everything else. That's a <laughs> interesting thing that comes out here. So um, I don't understand Rishi's question. He's a voyage optimization analyst with Start Smartship Hub. Which model should we take to project the speed of the vessel while doing speed scheduling, basis performance and weather en route? Uh, we use the best model you possibly can, isn't that the... <laughs> <laughs> answer to that one yeah i'm a bit lost uh, on, on what he means I, yeah i don't know i don't understand the question either so uh if we have a look at pascal bisogno is there any chance to separately understand the contribution of each energy saving device installed together in the same docking session for the performance improvement well, the better model you have, the more you can understand what different things are doing. I mean, I guess if you do five energy saving devices at once, it's quite hard to pick them apart. But uh, yeah, I guess well, you probably wouldn't do that. It's, it's a really good question, actually, and something that our models can be used for. But it requires um, some more setup um, because, uh, as, as Pasquale is saying, um, I mean, you install the SD, but at the same time, you also do a dry docking. And the dry docking also has a major impact on your performance. And it's hard to distinguish what's the difference between the impact of the SD and what's the impact of actually the dry docking. So there's, there's two ways um, so far that we've approached this problem. One is um, if you have data dating back not only to this dry docking, but even the, the, dry, the, dark, sorry, the dry docking prior to that, um, that we can compare how is your performance today post dry docking compared to your performance post dry docking of the previous dry docking, assuming that would be more or less comparable. Um, but there's very few ships that actually have sensor data dating back to dry docking. So then we have to default to the augmented approach, which again is a little bit less accurate. So that would be a downside of that approach. The other approach you can take is if you have two ships that are uh, more or less similar and one installs DSD and the other doesn't, that you can 
check the performance difference between the two where the one hand stalled it and the other didn't. Uh, but it's it's a yeah it's one of the most uh, difficult factors to account for when trying to validate the, the savings of an ESD. And it's not only ESDs; you can also validate, for example, the savings of a new paint that you applied. Um, so there are ways to remove large parts of the noise, but it's very hard to remove all factors and to give it a really one-on-one uh, -on -one comparison. The best we can do is comparing two dry dockings that are sequential to one another and the performance right post dry docking, or comparing to a similar ship that didn't have the ESD. Wow. There's a question that comes to my mind just on the people to do all of this stuff. I mean, because I mean, the same people you have working at Tokwa are the same people who could work at Google and get these AI jobs for enormous salaries we keep hearing about. I don't know how, how manual it is or how much you can automate it or how scalable it is. You know, I mean, I don't know how many, if we could, you know, it just sounds like very, uh, these relies on a lot of very expensive, young, clever people like you to do all this, <laughs> do this work. Is it, uh, do you have any thoughts about that or? Yeah, no, it's, it's a fair point. Uh, we, we build a company for scalability, though. So because our focus is, is really focused on only the ship performance modeling and we don't try to build this whole software solution around it and we don't try to do the routing part, we can focus only on the modeling and really be the best at that, especially if we focus only on sensor data. And so by doing so, we can build a really impactful solution with a rather limited team that can still serve the whole industry. So that's really our vision for Tokwa is just, you know, with very bright people, but not per se the largest team in the world, get the best possible models out there and then make those available in a very scalable and compatible approach with, uh, with the industry. So would a shipping company have to work with somebody personally or could they get a sort of automated way of doing this if they were work? So, yeah, it's somewhere in between. Uh, we work right. very, you know, automated, but obviously, I mean, there's pers a persons dedicated to every account and, and, and multiple engineers uh, that work on, on those projects. But our goal is to automate stuff as much as possible uh, so it can scale as hard as possible. And it's also easier for the people to use it that way. Yeah, I mean, the sort of core story behind this to me is, you know, better modeling can give enormous economic value. It takes a bit of effort and cost, but it looks like it pays off a million times over if you can actually make a better decision or get a charter that you wouldn't otherwise get or convince a charterer that your figures are, are right. You know, so, uh, yeah, as long as you can get the people to do it or you don't need that many people to do it, it all sounds like a great story and uh that's like something the whole industry should sign up to, I think, isn't it? And, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for selling that for us, Coral. No, it's <laughs> that point. Because we also see a lot of companies, they have um, some data scientists or some data data people in-house, which is which is great. But it's really to, to create models like these for a whole fleet, to maintain them, to check data quality, you really need a whole team of like six, seven very specialized engineers at least. And that's not something that every shipping company can or should do. And so our goal is just really, let's do this one thing really well, really scalable, so every company can benefit from it. And we only have to do it once with the, the very best people. Uh, so that's kind of our reasoning. Okay, so Jonathan Deeney, his LinkedIn page says he's performance manager with Frontline Shipping in uh, Glasgow. He's talking about vessels that do very short North Sea routes. Can you make a good model with those? Will their performance analysis be less accurate? I suppose the answer is we can do better models with uh, these sort of methods than anything else, but uh, I guess the more data, the better. I don't know if there's more you can say to that. That's always true. The more data, the better, but uh, it's a good question. Um, just going to reread it again. Okay, so that depends. There's there's a twofold answer on that. Uh, the benefit there is that we have seen similar vessels, uh, so frontline uh, tankers. We have seen similar vessels. Um, so the, the data has a kind of prior experience, prior learnings of how the ship should perform. Uh, and on a meta level, you can transfer the, the learnings that model have and then tweak it using the ship-specific data. And even if that ship-specific data is only North Sea routes, um, it knows from all the other experience it has that, okay, how, how the ship would also perform in these other conditions. So that's actually, uh, again, a benefit of our models that that they that can work with very limited data and still get good results. Um, so um, that should not have a major impact and the models should still be really accurate, uh, Jonathan. Yeah, the error analysis looks like it's a core part of what you're doing anyway. So does everybody get this? You, here's your model is 4% accurate. Yeah, it's, it's a thing we think is very important is that we're very yeah. transparent about the accuracy of the models and we're always um, comparing the predictions versus reality. So for every new voyage, for every new day, we're comparing actuals versus uh, uh, predictions versus reality. That way our users know, okay, can I actually trust this model? Yes or no? Because traditional approaches, they're more based on theory, like a CTRA curve, and then you just trust that the CTRA curve is right. But I mean, often it's not or it's, it's kind of off, but nobody can 
touch that with reality. They don't have that short feedback loop, but our, our product is really meant to, okay, you can compare the accuracy of the model to the actual data. And that way you always know, okay, how accurate is my model? Uh, and if it's not, you'll know. There's no way of hiding it. It's, we're trying to be very transparent about that. Yeah, I mean, I imagine a tanker operator would love to know, well, I've got this model, it costs this much and it's this accurate. And this model is a bit cheaper, but a lot less accurate. I suppose you can do all, all of that, can't you? Yeah, we, we again on our site we have a white paper on how to compare the accuracy of different models. So it's the thing oh, we often do is yeah. compare our modeling accuracy to whatever other model they are uh, using today. And then the even more valuable step is then in the second you know part of that project is uh, seeing how does this additional accuracy translate into additional fuel savings, for example, for routing. And that's that's kind of what we did with UNF. We compared the traditional model to 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 our model, and then how much does the additional accuracy translate into additional fuel savings? And then uh, you'll see, I mean, it's really a no-brainer. As I said, if you have sensor data and you're not yet capturing its potential, you should really, you know, go for it because you're leaving money on the table. And it's one of the first steps towards decarbonization, I think, is this, these efficiency gains. Oh, very good. Another, another question that occurred to me, so how does a shipping company actually work with you? I mean, is it easier if they work with a weather routing company and the weather routing company works with you, although Euronav works with you directly, I think. So you, I mean, I, I don't know what, is it, most shipping companies probably wouldn't be set up to work with you, would they, or directly, or could, could you? Yeah, so, I mean, both ways work. Today, we work mostly directly, but we're setting up partnerships with the largest shipping, uh, routing companies out there and other software companies uh, because they have good relations with their customers, and uh, if they want to handle the client side of things, that's fine. Uh, so it's uh, both solutions are possible, but uh, today we work mostly directly, and we're very glad to do so. Okay, so we've got two fairly straightforward questions. Ellen Janat Barstad is partner success manager with Kongsberg Digital, according to her LinkedIn. So is it learning from historical data? I think you said, yes, it did. And is the solution targeted towards specific segments? Uh, sounds like it isn't. So I don't know if I'll answer your questions. But... <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, there's two questions in there. Um, so yes, REI learns from historical data to, to, to get better accuracies. Um, and then second question, um, no, it works for all types of ships. I mean, some segments are harder to model than others, but we've modeled all types of ships uh, so far. And uh, we've seen, we've, we're able to achieve very high accuracy for all types of uh, ships, basically. Oh, very good. So Jose Ambiel is asking if you're using wave frequency in the models or is it just wave height? I imagine you use everything you can, is it? Or is it yeah, um, that's basically the answer. We use everything we can, which sometimes varies uh, depending on... Uh, on the customer, what weather data source they use or what they want to share, uh, but we use as much as we can, exactly. Yeah, oh, that's amazing. Um, in term, terms of the APIs, well, I mean, it's very common. I mean, I'm trying to imagine in my head how this works because it's, it's a continuous thing. It's not like you have your model and there you go. It's like a, so uh, I guess you've got to have all your data pipelines. That must be a very, very complicated part of this, but I suppose that's a yeah. thing you developed. Or, yeah, that's a good anything. point. I mean, it's a con it's a constant communication, a constant interface. It's fully automated, but it's constantly ongoing. So that's right. So we need to ingest all of the data. And you know, some uh, shipping companies, they develop this, this whole data part in-house and then they push it to us with their um, engineers. But there's also a lot of companies that work with data collection providers. Uh, so companies who do the data installation and data collection and then push it to the cloud for you. And those have platforms with like public APIs, which are already you know, pre-made. So we can work easily together with those. So actually the customer shouldn't really be bothered with that stuff like that. It should all go very automatically. If they have a data collection provider, they should just put us in touch and we can work together. The same with the solutions on top of that. They don't need to bother with the integration. It's between us and that that software company. So the, the shipping companies themselves are not really involved with all the technical hassle, let's say. Wow. So Basil Rochou, who's a CTO of Marine Weather Intelligence in Brittany in France. Um, where do you get the weather data from? Uh, so are you just using the data that the client gives or are you getting it yourself again another time and analyzing it? Yeah, so both options are possible. We have our own weather data source, so the public meet your data that everybody uses. Uh, but then there's many weather providers out there as well. And um, many shipping companies prefer that we use the same weather source that they use to, to ensure consistency, which is something we agree with. So we're actually pretty agnostic on that. We can use our own source or we can use the source that the customer prefers. And we actually prefer to do that because it uh, ensures consistency when they use the models that they put in the same weather data as it was used to train the model in the first place. Oh, well, that's great. Well, we've got about five minutes left and there's no, no more questions. Um, and I, I was fascinated by that graph just showing that the cleaning, um, showing that some cleaning is better than others. And even just that graph alone looks like it because <laughs> people have no clue how good the cleaning is most of the time, I imagine. And uh, stuff like this is uh, 
is, is, is helping. You know, the cost of cleaning is, is enormous. And, uh, and then the whole whole world of chartering is something that's just around the corner. But charterers want to know what how good ships are and they want to be convinced it's good. And I guess something like this, if there's a way to share it with charterers, that's, uh, that's enormously helpful in uh, in doing that part of it. So, um, I mean, we've got five minutes left. I don't know if there's sort of thought, thoughts you'd like to leave anybody with and then... Uh, Unless any more uh, questions pop up, we can finish them. Yeah. yeah, sure. I mean, but the last part, I think that's that's really true. Um, there's limited collaboration today between owners, charters, and managers on like when to do a cleaning, what's an effective cleaning, who pays for the cleaning, is there any other performance? And a part of the reason there's limited collaboration is because there's very yeah bad technology basically to analyze the performance and to discuss these topics and because there's already this 5 10 10 20 percent uncertainty it becomes a very gray murky discussion and it's more like becomes more of a fight and it's actually a discussion based on facts and we hope that providing more accurate models more accurate facts okay this is the amount you're over consuming today this is how much the cleaning actually saved that it, based on these numbers it's much easier for people to to work together if they want to so we just want to provide like the technological answer to enable people to work more closely together if they want to but then obviously there's going to be a whole change of mindset required in the way people cooperate commercially uh, and, and change the, the contracts legally as well but it's a, it's a mindset that we feel is slowly changing uh, across the industry like i was at a conference in, in hamburg last week where somebody said i mean we believe there's like at least 10% fuel savings in, in technology like this, but there's at least 10% fuel savings extra if we just find a way for owners, charters, and ship managers to work more closely together. And that's also something we really believe in for the future, but it's not something we can do by ourselves. We can try to provide a technology part, but then we need a change of mindset, change of contracts, just a change of working. But, you know, there are some larger companies, some more advanced companies already have this mindset and are figuring out ways to do so. And we'd like to work uh, actively together with those. Yeah, I mean, changing the world is a bit difficult for us, but I mean, putting a new technology in is something we can do, I think so. <laughs> we're, we're, we're allowed to dream, eh, Carl? We're allowed to dream. <laughs> I like the idea of new new technology much more. I mean, it's just even as a journalist, I hear about so many people, you know, like there's uh, air lubrication with bubbles. I mean, it'd be so useful to know very precisely what the IRA of, are of the, this was and the same for every other technology we hear about and uh, different fuels. And, you know, I mean, people need more more knowledge and the customers are shipping need more knowledge of uh, they want to be proved of everything they want a way to see the data themselves and look into it and uh, i think uh, all better modeling is all at the core of this and uh, i think it's a very strong story i think so uh, yeah yeah well Thank if you. you'd like to leave any any last words then i, I guess we can finish there i don't know how, how, how what do you want um the audience to do so you you you're open to uh, conversations from shipping companies and suppliers who and uh, you you're happy to hear from people and you're, you're ready to talk about uh, and we'll include your contact details in the follow-up email we send everyone. Is, is that what you'd like to see after yeah, the Yeah, that sounds great. So we're very open to work with everyone, like mostly obviously ship owners, but also charters, ship managers, uh, even software companies, right? Because we're not really competing with anyone directly. We just want to be one piece of the puzzle, do that really well, but we need to be part of an ecosystem of other solutions we work together with. So I mean, we're open to talk to data collection companies, to software companies, be it like routing platforms or other softwares. Um, but mostly, I mean, interesting for us are the, the people who pay the fuel, right? So the, the ship owners or the charterers who have sensors on their vessels today, even if it's only a part of the fleet, and they're not really doing something like this yet, and they want to capture that fuel saving potential, you know, the fuel savings hidden in that sensor data, then we should definitely definitely start a conversation and they can reach out to me, you know, via LinkedIn, via mail. Uh, if you're sharing my contact details, I think they were on the slides as well. I'd be happy to to start a conversation and discuss uh, what's possible for them, for sure. Well, well, thank you very much. Okay, well, we'll finish there. And uh, thank you. And I shall pass back to Farah for the closing words. Cheers. Thank you to our guest speaker, Kasima Morobi from Tokwa, and to all our viewers. We'll be sending you a YouTube video link soon with his contact details if you have any further questions. Join us for our next webinar on the 20th of June with SmartShip Hub, which you can book online at our website. Goodbye. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.